man. I'm a Presbyterian, and we do things decently and in order. And uh, you guys smell like Jesus. You really do. And I'm worshipped. I could go home now. Most of you don't know who in the world I am, but some of you probably have heard me on radio shows. And if that's the case, I have one thing to say to you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> God thought it was funny to put this voice, which is a lot better than yours. In this body, and I'm old too. I was in St. Louis recently, and a lady said to my assistant, I had to come. She said, really? She said, I wanted to see what he looked like. My assistant said, well, she said, I was greatly disappointed. I was expecting the Marlboro man. And uh, then I was in California, <laughs> this young man, after I'd finished teaching, came up and said, Dr. Brown, you're old. And I said, I know that. And he walked off, and when he got to the side of the stage, he turned around and said, I mean, you're really old. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I've loved this time. It's been quick in and quit out, quick out, and it was nothing that I expected. God's doing something really good here, and you're very fortunate to be a part of it. I love your pastor, well, your vice president for spiritual development. <laughs> they don't pay him much, but they give him a good title. <laughs> and his wife and the worship people, so good. For the last uh, few months, I've been working on a new book. Whenever I do that, the angels laugh. My friends wince, but I'm going to keep doing it till I get it right or get a bestseller so I can make a lot of money and say what I really think. Let me tell you the title of this book. It's How to Be Right Without Being Insufferable. How to Speak Truth to People That Don't Want to Hear the Truth. As you can imagine, over the past few months, I've been doing a lot of thinking about them. A lot of thinking about our culture, a lot of thinking about how in the world can we take the fire here, there. Let me read a couple of texts to you, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about it. The first is in Matthew 23. And if you're familiar with the 23rd chapter of Matthew, Jesus is really ticked. He says some of the most harsh things he ever said to anybody, and he said it to people like us, to religious leaders. And this is right before the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and Matthew writes, that Jesus said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. See? Your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes 
in the name of the Lord. And then flip over to the 19th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Same situation, more details, and Luke adds this. Now as he drew near the city, he wept over it. He said, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Then Jesus went into the temple and he began to drive out those who bought and sold in it. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you, you have made it a den of thieves. Before we begin, I must say something really important that I've learned. It's not politically correct, but it's true. We're right and they're wrong. We're right and they're wrong. And there are important and tremendous implications eternally and culturally and racially to be on the wrong side of the truth. A confession, when I was invited to come here, I decided I would pander to you and to your leaders. I'm politically conservative. I'm so conservative, I think Rush Limbaugh is a communist. <laughs> I'm orthodox, and I'm evangelical, and I have pr profound and solid Christian convictions, and you do too. And I'm a cynical old preacher, and I'm confrontational and I take no prisoners. I thought I'd say that. I could say it better than I just said it. And some of you would hiss, but some of you would cheer. And if I get enough cheers, it's worth it. I've repented, and I'm so very sorry. I don't know if you've ever read the novel, uh, Wendell Berry's novel, Jaber Crow. If you haven't, you ought to read it. You'll cry and you'll laugh. Jaber was a seminary student who funked out. And so he came home to his hometown, uh, Port William, and he became a barber in Port William. And, uh, the book is written from the perspective of an old man like me, and Jaber uh, tells stories of what happened in Port William. He also, to make some extra money, works as a janitor in the local Methodist church and as a grave digger. And in one scene, Jaber was tired, and as he often did in the evening when he cleaned up the church, he went and he lay down on a pew and he went to sleep and he, and he had a dream. And in the dream, everybody in the town, the liars and the fools 
and the preachers and the church people and the good and the bad and the evil and the thieves and the honest and the dishonest. Everybody was sitting in the church. And when Jaber woke up, he was weeping. Jesus would have understood that. If I'd been in Jerusalem, I would have been his cheerleader. Read that 23rd chapter of Matthew. I would have said, you tell them it's time somebody did. And when he, and when he went into the temple and kicked butt, I would have said, you go, Jesus, you go. And then I would notice the tears. What? What's with that? What's with the tears? If you hang out with Jesus very much, you learn to see things through his eyes. You learn to feel where he feels, and you learn to be angry where he's angry. But let me tell you something. You learn to weep where he weeps. When you read this and you've been thinking about it the way I have the last few months, and if you feel as guilty and shamed as I do, welcome to the club. What about the tears? Jesus spoke truth. Sometimes it was hard and in your face. Sometimes he made a verbal obscene gesture when he spoke, but he spoke truth, but always with tears. When we speak our truth and there are no tears, it's nothing but self-righteousness. My beloved friend is Tony Campolo. We don't agree on anything. Tony is my pinko commie friend, and I'm, I'm his right-wing reactionary friend. We did a television show on a network, the Odyssey Network out of New York for a year. Uh, it took place on a set like a diner in New York, and we were two old guys debating every issue you can imagine. We did it because we wanted to demonstrate how you could disagree and love each other and be in the same family. And the thing I heard all over the country after a year of those television programs was, you guys really do love each other, don't you? And we really do. Tony said, I wouldn't, I'm a Presbyterian. But Tony said we could put our heads together in moon America without pulling our pants down. <laughs> and recently, you may have heard Tony's changed his views on gay marriage. And a lot of his friends have left him, won't speak to him. He's not invited to a lot of places anymore. And we were to debate, to debate a couple of months ago, and he called me. And he said, Steve, you know I love you. And if you don't feel like you can participate in this with me, I, brother, I'll understand. And I said, Tony, are you crazy? I love you. You're my brother. Man, I never agreed with your wacky views before. Now. Nothing's different. Of course I'm going to do this with you. And he got emotional, and he could hardly talk. And he passed the phone to Peggy, his wife. And I said, how are you guys doing? And she, she said, okay, as long as we have friends like you. Tony was invited a couple of years ago to speak for a gay lesbian convention, a lot of people 
were angry with him about that. And he got up, and you know what he said to him? He said, I'm not here to tell you that what you're doing is right. I'm here to tell you that I love you, and, and what you're doing is going to kill you. And, I, and then he started sobbing, and he couldn't talk. And they gave him a standing ovation. What happened? Listen to me. The tears happened. I remember when I was a kid in high school, when I graduated third from the bottom in high school, I did awful, except in the history class. The teacher said on the day of the exam when I had completed it, Stephen, you wait after everybody leaves. I'm going to talk to you. They left, and I sat there, and I knew I was in trouble. She came over to me, and she said, you're not living up to your potential. And I wanted to say, but didn't, get in line. Everybody says that to me, and I'm tired of it. And then she said, you can do, and she started crying. I didn't know what to do, I didn't know what to do man. I'm just a kid. But I'll tell you something. I told her, stop crying. I'm going to make it better. And I worked my tail off. I can't say I became a PhD in history, but I want you to know I did really, really well. Why was that? Because of the tears. Oh, God, don't let us back off on the truth. But give us the tears the compassion, the love, the brokenness. Jesus not, Jesus not only uh, spoke truth with tears, he showed mercy with tears. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how, how often I would have gathered you as a mother hen gathers her chicks, and you would not. We're called to show mercy, too. But it's a different kind of mercy. Jesus gave grace and mercy, and we need it so desperately. Listen to me. Your sin, and by the way, you don't fool me, just because you're a student or a faculty member at Liberty. I've been doing this for a long time, and I know you. Your sin is a gift that God gave to you when you know it. And listen to me, your obedience when you know it is the most dangerous place you live. Do you ever cry about your own sin and neediness? You ever cry about a Christian brother or sister's sin and neediness? Only then can you cry for a pagan world. I have a big thing for Israel. I spent some time there working on a book on anti-Semitism. And one of the things I've taught throughout my ministry is that when you witness to your Jewish friends, the first thing you should do is ask forgiveness for what's been done in the name of Christ. I got a letter a while ago from a lady, and she said, Steve, I've been listening to you forever, and I try to do what you say to do. She said, let me tell you what happened, and I blew it. I was on a plane with this lady, and she told me she was Jewish, and I remember what you said. <laughs> so I said to her, let me say something to you that's important. Please forgive me 
for what's been done. And she said, then I started sobbing. <laughs> I couldn't stop crying. And this Jewish lady started patting me on the back and saying, honey, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. So I blew it, and I wanted you to know. Two weeks later, I got a letter from her. And she said, well, maybe I didn't. Let me tell you what happened. That Jewish lady I told you about, she called me. She wants to know where I go to church, <laughs> and she wants to go with me next Sunday. We're not do-gooders. We're people with a broken heart and compassion that comes from Jesus and gives us the tears for ourselves and for them. And I'm almost finished. Jesus not only spoke truth with tears, he not, not only showed mercy to us and them with tears, after he spoke his words of truth and mercy, he walked a short distance to a hill in the shape of a skull and he gave himself. And the cross of Christ is the best example of the tears of God. There's a, there's a prayer in the rabbi's manual. Let me share it with you. Thou art great, and we are small. Thou art infinite, and we are finite. Thou art eternal, and we tarry but just a little while. Thou art everything, and we are nothing. But with all of thy power and greatness, thou dost bend down low and listen to the sound of our tears as they strike the ground. True, but there's more. He came and mingled his tears with ours. I knew your founder, by the way, and I loved him. I had dinner with him one time. One time I went to the head of the American Jewish Committee invited me to a gathering, a national gathering of rabbis from all across America. And they invited Dr. Falwell, and I was the only Gentile other than him, the only Goyim in this big auditorium. I prayed for Dr. Falwell, because I knew if he screwed it up, I was going to be in trouble. And the rabbi, you should have seen their body language, like they're not very happy at all that he showed. It was at the Fontainebleau in Miami. And they're not happy at all. And not only that, he was picketed when he came into the place. And he was very, very tired and worn out. And he got up and he gave his speech. And then they had a question and an answer period. And one of the rabbis got up and said, Dr. Falwell, what do you want from us? And he said, I don't want anything from you. I have everything I need. I have come here to say I love you. And even if you don't love me, I'm still going to love you. I came, I came here, and I'm tired. I came here to say I'm going to be your friend. And even if you don't want me to be your friend, I'm going to be your friend. Smells like Jesus, sacrifice, tears, love. Let me tell you a story, and I'm finished. Ken Smith is a friend of mine. He's a Baptist pastor, and he's an old guy, old white guy like me. We meet once a year around Christmas just to make sure that one of us hasn't died. <laughs> And two, we're both cramming for finals. Two years ago, he was telling me about an African-American pastor friend of his. And he was, I, you would know his name, and I would know his name, but I can't remember. He's very famous. And he's 
my age. And Ken said, we were having lunch, and I said to him, what are you looking for when you get to heaven? Looking for the trumpets and the music and the joy? And he said, well, yeah, sort of. But what I'm really looking for is so I can be there and watch when my Jesus picks up the church and shakes the church in the face of Satan. And Jesus will say, that's all I had. <laughs> that's all I had. And I still kicked your butt. <laughs> I love it. And he will. With our sin and our silliness and our shallowness and our need, he will use us in a world as long as we don't forget about the tears. You think about that. Amen. Pastor Steve, we, um, we love you, and um, honestly, we need to hear that. Every single one of us need to hear that, and we're so thankful for that. Um, can we just, can we, before we walk out of here, I, I, want, him to, to, I want him to understand that, that um, we're all, how many of you are always guilty? I'm, I'm so many times guilty of wanting to win the point and not the person. And in days like this, I'm reminded of the posture of Christ and the tears of Christ, and so many times I just want to tear into somebody instead of tear up with them. Anybody here just felt the conviction and the freedom of God's grace on me despite that? And you just, you, can, you just can you just wave at Pastor Steve that that was a word for you today, that that was really for you today? Will you just, Pastor Steve, thank you for bringing God's word, brother, all right? God bless you guys. We love you, all right? Uh, you're dismissed. We'll see you on Wednesday.